your Bibles again with me this morning to the letter of 1 Peter. Finishing the, really the opening section of 1 Peter chapter 1 this morning. Uh, the focus will be on verses 10 to 12. I'm going to read beginning with verse 3 again. This is God's holy and valuable word. Give careful attention as it's as it's read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, And these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. I'll end our reading there. Again, our focus is on the last uh, three verses there, verses 10 through 12 this morning. Well, since the Industrial Revolution, really, and and even more in recent decades with uh, the Internet and other Uh, rapid advances in technology, we don't think a a whole lot, I think, uh, we don't think it a a really big deal uh, to have a very different experience in life than um, uh, people in the very recent past, than just just one generation uh, prior. Things have changed so fast um, that, that within a lifetime, you know, in the last century plus, within a lifetime, one person could go from the, the presumed impossibility of flight to at the end of their life, seeing rockets shooting to the moon, someone could go from you know, knowing uh, stationary rotary phones to knowing our smartphones and uh, having access to virtually all knowledge and ordering pizza and taking pictures and, and all that we know that they do. Uh, in the last century, things have, have emerged and lives have changed in a ways, uh, ways that within a lifetime were nearly unimaginable, that people... Uh, simply looked forward to or speculated about or, or dreamed about. Um, most people in history lived with you know, no advances in, in transportation technology, really, for, for thousands of years. The fastest thing was a horse. Well, Peter here is encouraging his readers to see their privileged place in history uh, over people who came before, not technologically, not uh, nationally or socially, but, but spiritually, uh, their privileged place in history. To see that the salvation that he's just described in Christ, in, in the first uh, nine verses here that we've been studying recent weeks, the salvation that they know, the blessings that they understand and have, um, are, are not, they're not different, they're not unexpected from believers that came before them, uh, Old Testament believers, but they were not known, they weren't experienced in the same way. Uh, that they have, that the relationship that they have with Christ is not not only great um, because of the great spiritual blessings and benefits they have in their union with Christ, but they also are incredibly privileged over others in history, even angels, he says here, um, because of what they know of Jesus, because they know Jesus. I want you to understand that privilege this morning as well. Um, To to make that point, though, Peter discusses the Scriptures here, which uh, to him, of course, at this point is is the Old Testament, um, uh, the prophets, and implies some things very important to our understanding of 
of our Bibles. Um, and so I want to consider two points first about our Bibles, about the Scriptures um, that, are, that are implied here that, that lead into Peter's main point about our privilege in knowing Jesus. So uh, the, the first point uh, will be a bit of an excursus, a, a, a lesson uh, implied from what Peter says here, leading to the second point, which is, is Peter's main point about our privilege in knowing Christ. So first, two points about understanding the Scriptures. Uh, in, in reading your Bibles, understand the, the central theme and unity of the Bible. Uh, the central theme and unity of the Bible. Look at what, what Peter says here in verse 10. He says, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come. And uh, the prophets is often shorthand for uh, the whole Bible, right? The whole, the whole Old Testament. Sometimes it's the law and the prophets. Sometimes it's the prophets. Uh, he's speaking about the Old Testament. What did the prophets prophesy about? Uh, what, what's the summary of their message? What is the Old Testament centrally and primarily about? He says it's about the grace of God that was given. The grace of God given for his people. And verse 11 says it was this, the Spirit of Christ speaking through, inspiring those writers of the Old Testament. Uh, and what does he say they, they wrote about? They, they pointed toward uh, even more particularly, more specifically, verse 11. Uh, they predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So it's really important to understanding your Bible, to appreciating the whole thing, to seeing it as, as a whole book, to see that central theme. Of it, the story of God providing grace to sinners through Jesus, uh, through His, particularly through His suffering and through His His glory. Um, there's a lot more in the Bible than that. In one sense, there's a lot more than that explicit message, that those explicit words, of course. Uh, but it's all connected to that. Right? Everything in the Bible serves that purpose. Everything in the Bible is part of that story. So we ought to be able to ask of, of any page in the Bible, any passage in the Bible, and this is a good practice in, in studying God's Word, uh, how is this concerned with Jesus? How does this point me to Jesus? Uh, there, there's nothing outside of that story, that, that central theme, right? How does this teach me what Jesus is like or teach me of my need for Him? How does this fit into to the story of God's plan of sending Jesus uh, to save His people? Again, Peter says the prophets prophesied the grace that would come, uh, predicting the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Uh, in, in our day, uh, because of dominant theological influences, um, the Old Testament is often downplayed um, or, or even ignored. Um, it's, it's thought by many Christians to be somehow lesser or, or uh, far less important than the New Testament or really not important at all. Like it was, it was for the Jews. The New Testament is for uh, Christians since Christ. Um, you know, you can read the Old Testament if you want to. There's, um, there's some good interesting stories, interesting characters. There's some devotional nuggets in the Psalms, maybe some verses that will look good on your wall from Isaiah. Um, but um, what the really important stuff, what you really need to know, all you need to know is in, in the New Testament. Um, uh, sadly, many people view the, their Bibles that way. I was listening a few years ago to Christian radio, to uh, uh, just around here, a, a Bible teacher and host, and he was uh, espousing that view, that very view of the Bible, of the Old Testament, and then, in fact, he even applied that to First Peter and Second Peter, because he was saying, explaining to us that Peter was the apostle to the Jews, and so his letters were written to the Jews. We don't need to read them. Don't bother reading First and Second Peter. Well, Peter's own perspective here is that the Scriptures are one story, right? One church, one salvation. Uh, if, if you're a Christian, the Old Testament as well is, is uh, your salvation history. It's your family history. Uh, it's, it's the history of the church, of one church. The church did not begin in the New Testament. The church is throughout the whole Bible. Uh, the whole Bible is the unfolding of the story of God's grace through Jesus Christ. Uh, think of Peter's own life. Um, Peter's own life in the Gospels is an illustration in some ways of the consequences of not seeing Jesus fully 
uh, particularly in, in the Old Testament, in the prophets. Um, it's, Peter says here in verse 11, um, he predicted Christ through the prophets. He predicted the sufferings of Christ. Uh, but Peter and the other apostles, we know, didn't, didn't understand and expect the Messiah to suffer as Jesus did. What did, what did Peter do when Jesus told him on one occasion when, when Jesus told him that he was going to suffer and die in Jerusalem? Peter rebuked him to his face. Right? And then um, when it came time for Jesus to be arrested uh, and, and taken to his particular suffering on the cross the next day, what did, Jesus, what did Peter do? He drew his sword and tried to defend Jesus from the reason that he came. And when Jesus was being condemned and was very near his execution, uh, Peter thought all was lost and denied association altogether with Jesus uh, three times. Uh, after the resurrection, there were disciples, as Luke tells us, on the road to Emmaus, right? And Jesus appeared to them. They didn't, they didn't recognize him. Uh, they were downcast. Uh, their, uh, their mis- the one they hoped was the Messiah had died and all was lost. And it says Jesus explained to them from all the scriptures there in Luke 24. So he's explained to them from the, the law and the prophets and the Psalms how it all spoke of him. Uh, it all pointed to him and showed how he had to die uh, and raise again. It's important that we see uh, our Bibles in that way. It, it, it's important that we understand where, where do we see the sufferings of Christ in the Old Testament. What, what Peter missed for so long. We see the sufferings of Christ uh, in, in the sacrifices, for sure. This was the, the point of the sacrifices, to, to point uh, God's people ahead to Christ, the different kinds of sacrifices, the need for them, the priesthood. There's so much there that points to Christ. We see Christ suffering, perhaps in the pattern of suffering for the, for the prophets. This the pattern of, of suffering and waiting uh, in God's people. Uh, in the Bible, we see the suffering of Christ in the Psalms and uh, prophecies of his suffering, and also again the pattern uh, of suffering uh, in the Psalms. We see it in the suffering servant in Isaiah, and very clearly in Isaiah chapter 53. I think it's particularly important that we would see his sufferings in the Old Testament, see that this was God's plan all along. It's not some separate story that. You know, because the, the, the glory is the part that's easy to see. Right? The glories that would follow, as Peter says here in, in verse 11. That's the part we want to see. That's the part Peter and the other disciples knew well. The glory of Messiah's kingdom. And the, the rule and power of the Messiah when he would come. But, but we can know from the entire Bible that the cross was not something new. It wasn't a surprise. It's not something that uh, we have to... Uh, explain away because it doesn't fit or seems like a failure. What a comfort it is to see the unity of the Scriptures, uh, see God's plan all along. It should make a difference uh, in understanding our own sufferings, our own trials, um, understanding them rightly in, in the context of God's plan. I think of the difference that it made, again, uh, in Peter's life uh, to come to that understanding that uh, the Bible, the whole Bible speaks of the sufferings and the glories of Christ. Um, in Acts chapter 5, there's a, a powerful story of Peter and other apostles preaching Christ in Jerusalem, and uh, as they were told not to do, and the authorities uh, bring Peter and, and the others in, and they beat them and charge them not to speak ever again in the name of Jesus. Then it says, they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Being united to Christ to to, to see and understand his suffering and glory uh, as as the theme of the scriptures um, helps us to understand our own suffering as it did Peter. In the end of this letter, Peter will write, rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. Also, just before we move on from this point, note that Peter says it was the Spirit of Christ uh, speaking through the prophets. It was the Spirit of Christ in the Old Testament uh, inspiring the writers. Uh, That's not a common designation for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, but this isn't the only one. We read of the Spirit of Christ elsewhere in the New Testament. 
The point is simply that Jesus was active through the Spirit in the Old Testament. Uh, it's further evidence of the, the unity uh, of, of the Scriptures, of the whole Scriptures. Well, the, the second lesson about uh, our Bibles, reading and, and interpreting God's Word, I'll mention just very briefly, just a, a principle we call uh, in theology progressive revelation. In other words, uh, simply the idea that God reveals himself uh, progressively, gradually, uh, over time. Um, he didn't just dump all of it, the whole story and, and every command and every implication and a full understanding of, of his entire plan on Adam or on Noah or on Abraham um, he, he, uh, for each in each time period and with different people was, was building on his story, building on his revelation of himself. And, and that, that comes from, as we'll note in a moment, just Peter saying here that the prophets didn't know everything. Uh, the prophets longed to know further about God's plan and his, his revelation. Uh, and sometimes some of the the differences we see between different parts of the Scripture, some, what, what sometimes people identify as contradictions, are simply this. It's, it's God's progressive revelation, uh, revealing himself um, gradually over time. Uh, I think there are lessons for us in that, practical lessons, perhaps for how we teach others, uh, that we would teach others, meet them where they are, and teach them gradually, progressively, uh, not expect them to understand everything all at once. Also, uh, the, the application that we would be content with what God has revealed to us uh, at a certain point, right? Like the prophets, we don't know all of God's plan. We don't know the details of God's redemption in the future. Uh, and yet we can be confident that he's given us uh, what we need to this point. Well, let's move to our, our second point then, the, the, Peter's final uh, indicative here, your privilege to know Christ. So we've been talking uh, in the last couple of weeks about this concept of indicative and imperative, right? And this, this, this important distinction in understanding uh, the Bible, understanding this, this letter here, the indicative is your, your status, who you are already. It's not an instruction about how to live. This is who you are in Christ. So Peter has been giving his readers the indicative. You're chosen by the Father. You're sanctified. God has caused you to be born again. Uh, he's given you a living hope. Uh, he's, you are those who rejoice. Uh, you have this untouchable inheritance. And uh, next week we'll begin to get into his instructions that flow from that. But here he concludes this description of their blessed status as chosen people of God uh, by describing their privilege over uh, even the prophets and angels. Uh, so let's just consider both of those uh, in order. First, uh, look at verse 10 again, where Peter says, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and increase, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating. So he says the, the prophets longed to, to see and to understand fully uh, the things that they spoke about, the things that they wrote about. Uh, they didn't know uh, all, uh, all the details about what they were, what they were predicting, what they were prophesying, uh, particularly about God's salvation in Christ. They didn't know who it would be or when it would be or how the details would work out. That doesn't mean that their prophecies were, were meaningless, were gibberish for the people who heard them in their time. They were meaningful promises of God's grace to come. Um, they were important for them, but they never got to see, they never got to know, particularly the person of Christ. Uh, they didn't know when and, and again how all of these things would work out. They didn't know the full revelation of, of God in the flesh. They didn't uh, have the full revelation of, of the union of God's people with, with the God-man. Uh, they didn't know and understand the dramatic story of, of his death and his resurrection. They're, they're very much, again, like our position, the position we're in with relation to Christ coming again. Right? We, we know certain things about it. We know His promise to come again. We know that He's coming to judge and there will be a resurrection and so on. But there are many things we don't know. Uh, the, the when and many questions of how. And things that we might long to know and, and wonder about. Uh, this is how he describes the prophets here. He says they made careful searches and inquiries. That suggests that they 
the, the Old Testament writers and Old Testament people talked about it. They wondered. They asked each other questions, much like, maybe like we do about the return of Christ. Right? What, what is it going to be like? When, when is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? Maybe they made guesses. There, I think there's a, a, a righteous way to long and to, to speculate in, in a sense. There's, there's also uh, wrong and dangerous ways to do that. But uh, the Old Testament writers were saved by faith in the Messiah uh, and, and his suffering for them. They just longed to know the details, to know him. Peter's saying that this is what his readers know. I, I wonder if this came to Peter's mind because of experience that he had with, with Jesus. Uh, remember what, what we call the transfiguration, uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus' uh, glory, Peter and James and John got to see Jesus' glory particularly. And, and who came, who showed up and was talking with Jesus? It was Moses and Elijah, right? Some of the Old Testament prophets. And what were they talking about? What would Jesus and Moses and Elijah discuss? Well, Luke tells us they were talking about what Jesus would accomplish in Jerusalem. They were talking about his, his death on the cross, his, his particular suffering, and the glories that would follow. As, as Peter says here, this is what the prophets longed to know. What a, what a conversation that must have been uh, to listen to, to hear uh, Moses and Elijah learning. Uh, the details that they longed to know. So this really is incredible, what Peter says of his readers. What he says is, is true of you as well. You're privileged. If you haven't thought of it this way, you're privileged far beyond the great Moses and Elijah because you know Jesus, because you have His Word, uh, because you know the details of what He taught, of, of how He gave Himself for you, of what it means to be united to Him. Uh, you know, uh, you, you've heard His promises to be with you, to return. Uh, you live in the reality of His, his reigning as sovereign King. Uh, we might think that it would, it would so strengthen our faith or be a greater privilege to experience what Moses and Elijah did and seeing the miracles that they did and speaking with God as they did. Peter says, no, you are far more privileged than they are. Jesus himself made, made the same point, really, in Luke 10, verse 23. He said uh, to, the pri to the disciples privately, he said, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So that's, that's true of you, as it was of, of Peter's readers, that you have... You really have more reason for confidence and joy and hope even than Moses and Elijah uh, who spoke with God, who spoke for God. Secondly, Peter says you have this privilege over the angels. Uh, verse 12, it was revealed to them, he's still speaking of the prophets, they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Now, we know, we know too little about angels to explain every nuance of what, what it means for angels, uh, to, what, what Peter is saying about them here. You know, we don't know where they are, what they know, or what they do exactly in, in many details at all. But speaking of what Christ did for his people, uh, it's so in interesting that Peter says that even angels long to look into it, that somehow angels, it seems, lack in experience and knowledge of Christ compared to you. Uh, the, the verb that's translated, they, they're long to look into, has, uh, has the sense of, of looking into something from the outside, straining to see, looking into something. Um, that Many Jewish writings, uh, even outside of the Bible, uh, picture angels as watching, observing what's going on in the earth, but uh, there's, there's some evidence of that uh, in the Scriptures as well. In, in Luke 15, uh, Jesus says, uh, what, what does Jesus say uh, happens when one sinner repents? Uh, the angels rejoice in heaven. They, they know and they praise God uh, in heaven. There's, there's, of course, lots of speculation about what angels are, what angels do, what angels are like, what angels are interested in. Uh, you know, even the classic proverbial illustration about um, 
meaningless speculation, theological speculation, is, is angels, right? How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Um, there's much that we don't know. It's natural to wonder what are angels like? What do they do? What are they interested in? But uh, Peter says here, in some way, the angels have been eagerly waiting and watching uh, to see the sufferings and the glories of the Messiah too. Uh, this is what angels are interested in. Uh, this is what they're most concerned with. And, and it's you who have come to know and experience it uh, personally. Uh, Ed Clowney pictures angels peering, as it were, over the battlements of heaven to behold what God had done in his King Jesus. Uh, and that's the Jesus that we know and have experienced. So, you have privilege to know even what angels are most interested in, but most in awe of. Uh, you have in knowing Jesus a privilege over the great prophets in the Old Testament, uh, in knowing the sufferings of Christ, perhaps uh, particularly in knowing the glories of Christ, uh, in living now in the age of the glory of Christ. Uh, you, you live in the age that the prophets looked forward to, the, the ascension of Christ, the accession of Christ to the throne uh, of God. Um, reigning over all things, returning in judgment soon, he says. Uh, the Old Testament people, the angels, longed to know the Messiah, to, to see him on the throne, to know that God's kingdom had come, uh, to know he was sovereignly ruling the nations and, and moving history towards its climax. And this is what you have in knowing Christ. Uh, praise God. Let's, let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you again this morning for these encouragements from your word. Uh, we thank you for the weeks we've spent in these uh, assurances of who we are in Christ that you've given to us through Peter, that we are the, the way that we've been chosen and uh, born again to joy and to hope. We thank you for the uh, incredible description here this morning of how we're privileged even over the prophet's and over angels. Lord, we pray that you would uh, encourage us in that, help us to live in that um, privilege and hope and joy this week, uh, that we would encourage each other in that as well. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.